Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, we're going to talk about Professor Dungeon Master's video about cheap miniatures. We have two Kickstarters to look at today. Monsters of Drakenheim, the Kickstarter by Ghostfire Gaming, in partnership with the Dungeon Dudes. The Cairn 2nd Edition boxed set. We're going to look at the new white that has come out for Tales of the Valiant for the Monster Vault. I'm going to show off the new search engine for Sly Flourish, because I worked on it really hard and I want to show it off. Today's big topic is going to be the two different games we play at the same table in our fantasy role-playing games, and what that means about our games and what we can do and how we can prepare. And we're going to cover more questions the March 2024 Patreon Q&A all today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in tabletop role-playing games. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to the City of Arches sourcebook, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, a dedicated Discord server, the monthly Q&A, a bunch of tools to help you run your games, tons and tons and tons of stuff that you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. It's a really good deal. People are telling me all the time about what a great deal it is to join the Patreon, so please consider joining the Patreon. You can find a link to it in the show notes and to the patrons of Sly Flourish. Thank you so much for your outstanding support. So Professor Dungeon Master did a really good video on where to find miniatures. I just wanted to give a quick highlight on this because it's a great, it's a really great video that tells you lots of different ways to find cheap miniatures for your game. So if you are looking to get cheap miniatures for your game, he has lots of suggestions about where you can get them, where you can get painted miniatures, unpainted miniatures, you know, all different kinds of places. This one I thought was really funny was like, you can go buy the heroes, the, the warriors of Crinbox sets. I've seen this before a couple of times. You can get the, the tile campaign case and you can get the, the token campaign case for D&D for like three bucks at Ollie's. I don't even know what Ollie's is. Some other people know what Ollie's is, but on occasion they've been getting lots of the heroes of Crin board game the terrain cam campaign case and the miniatures, the, the little token campaign case. I would not recommend buying them at full price. I've had them. I actually gave them away because I have so many miniatures I didn't need them. And they're not bad. And if you don't have anything, they're pretty cool. For $3, they're totally worth it. And I'd say for $20, they are probably worth it at $20. I don't think I'd pay more than $20 for like the campaign case miniatures. But those those are a great way to, to, to get them. But there's lots of other places. This is, I got I to gotta poke because I think it's really funny. No matter how big your company is you're also you're always one aisle away from bankruptcies lots of different op options and lots of different ways that you can get miniatures for your games miniatures are one of these tough things where like you, there's no just easy straightforward way to get miniatures that getting miniatures is a long process you have to get like bargain bin places getting them on ebay is not always such a terrible place you know but getting getting 3d printed miniatures stuff like that this is one area where playing online has a huge advantage over playing in person because it's the, the miniature collection hobby, which is its own hobby, I think is a sucker's game. And it's because you'll never have the miniatures that you always need. There, you'll always be one ghoul shy of all of the ghouls that you need. I've been collecting miniatures for 20 years and I've got thousands of miniatures and I still run into the problem of either not being able to find the one that I need or I never have enough of the one that I need and I have to substitute a different kind of miniature for it. And you could just, you could, you know, there's no upper limit to the amount of money you could spend on miniatures. And I just don't think it's a, it's a, I think there are other ways. I have my lazy monster tokens, which I recommend. And there are other things that you can do. You can actually make cooler monster tokens. The idea of getting a one inch adhesive magnet and a, an epoxy sticker and then printing out a token and getting a one inch hole punch and punching it out and putting it on your magnet and then putting your epoxy sticker on the top. You can make really cool custom tokens for very, very little. And you can make a bunch of generic tokens to kind of fill in the blank and then use one custom token. It's a great approach. Anyway, I have a link to that in my video. But also, I think that uh, Dungeon Crafts video, uh, PDM's video about getting miniatures on the cheap is a really good video to watch. So check that out. Our friends over at Ghostfire Gaming and the Dungeon Dudes are going together once again to make a book called The Monsters of Drakenheim. It has already crossed 4,400 people that backed it, PDF and print version. This is also the first time. So it is a bunch of like 300 pages of ter you know, 150 terrifying monsters. 10 easy to run layers, so it's including some layers in the book. And if you have Dungeons of Drakenheim, you know the quality of the material that's coming out here. And Ghostfire Gaming makes fantastic books. So this is definitely going to be cool. You know, I have friends that are working on this book. It looks really, really great. This is also, interestingly, the first time that D&D Beyond is one of the options, that they somehow worked out some kind of deal with D&D Beyond so that you can... I think it is only... I don't think it's one of the pledges... I think you can only get it as an add-on, but as an add-on, you can get D&D Beyond access to it. This is the first time that we've heard of where a company is 
with a product that isn't even done yet has a relationship where they're going to be able to get these products in D&D Beyond. So, so there's that. I, of course, recommend instead of getting the D&D Beyond version that you should get the PDF version because you can download it and you can save it and you can put it on a USB disk and you can put it in your safe deposit box and you know that you'll always have it and you never have to worry about them changing their mind or some kind of license agreement going on. I know, I am, I am sure that the license agreement that you sign with D&D Beyond gives them permission to remove their access, remove your access to this book if you've got it. I am almost sure that that is in there. I haven't read it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they are not going to guarantee that you will always have access forever because they can't and because they won't. So lots of cool options, lots of different ways to get it. Uh, I picked up the PDF version of this because I don't know that I need a physical, another physical monster book. I have so many physical monster books, but it's really, really neat. And the quality of the material that comes out of Ghostfire Gamings and, and Dungeons of Drakenheim is a fantastic book on itself. So this is definitely a Kickstarter that I recommend taking a look at. You can find a link to the Monsters of Drakenheim Kickstarter in the show notes. Another interesting Kickstarter is for Cairn, the Cairn 2E box set. So Cairn is a very lightweight 20 page RPG. You can get the rules for free off uh, drive through RPG. You can also get them off Dean to beyond. And this is another one where like, there is no reason for you to not go check out the free rules because they're totally free. And uh, I picked it up. I read through it yesterday. I, I've, I actually bought a couple of physical copies. Bob World Builder recommended on his channel. And I so I bought a couple of physical copies because they were like, they were super cheap. How much is it for buy a physical copy? $3. You can buy $3. I think I bought like four of them. Shipping is going to cost way more than the, than the book. So you can get a $3 version of this thing. Five by eight book. It's about 20 pages long. Glue stitch. It's unfortunately not saddle stitch. It'd be cool if it was saddle stitch, but whatever. We can, who's going to complain for three bucks? And it's a very lightweight RPG. It is a roll under system. So you have your attributes, your, your checks are to roll under, uh, very lightweight hit points are sort of, you know, everything is very abstracted hit points are you, 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 you remove the, they have sort of damage thresholds. You automatically have damage when you roll your damage die, but you have damage thresholds you have to cross. So it is, you don't roll attack rolls. That seems to be kind of a new thing too. Anyway, you can take a look at what the rules are for Karen 1 because it'll give you a good idea what the rules are going to look like for Karen 2. Now, this one, it was like, wow, it's really neat. One, one thing that's interesting is they have this exclusive heavy-duty box set that includes two books, a GM screen, a bunch of character sheet pads, three core books that are included, including an adventure book, all in one big box set. And it's 50 bucks, which is really cheap for a small print run uh, box set like this so i was like you know what i'm for like normally i would just say yeah hey, go check out the pdf and, and get what you want but 50 dollars is a really good price for a box set that includes all of this kind of thing so it looks like a really good value but if you're not sure if you want sort of another kind of old school lightweight rpg because there's a lot of them these days definitely check out at least the free rules to see if the rules are the kind of thing that you'd be interested in and then you can decide like is it would it be kind of fun to get a box set i collect everything so i'm like yeah i definitely want to go pick up a a, a box set but but yeah, fifty dollars for a box set like this is a really, really good deal. So check that out. They have twenty three hundred backers so far with twenty five days left to go, and that's the Karen Second Edition Kickstarter. My recommendation is download the free rules, check them out, and if you like it, then you can decide if you want to back it. Tales of the Valiant has on occasion been posting previews of the monsters that we're going to see in the upcoming Tales of the Valiant Monster Vault, which I think is coming out in May, so not too far off, right? A couple months. And they have the white. The white is a really interesting creature for me. I already belong to email. The white is a really interesting creature for me because it's one where I f have felt let down by the 2014 monster manual version of the white for a long time. That as a, as a CR three monster, I felt like it should be doing significantly more damage and be a significantly greater threat than what the 2014 monster manual white was able to do. And the reason why is they were overweighting the life drain that life drain counts I think in, we figured out in their math that if a life drain counts as, as double the amount of damage that it would do. So if you were going to, if, if you have a life drain for 10 points, it's the equivalent of 20 points of damage. And that just doesn't play out. Just because it has a life drain doesn't mean that the threat should be half as much as it normally is. So we're starting to see whites that have a new one. The white to me, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. The white to me is also a really important creature because of the challenge rating that it has. It sits at what I think to be the perfect challenge rating for a monster. I think CR3 
is one of the best challenge ratings of monsters, and I will explain why. But because I that I have such a heavy weight on CR3 in particular, the white is a monster that fits in there. So taking a look at it, and now we have multiple versions of whites. We have the level up advanced 5e white, we have the 2014 D&D monster manual white, and we have the Tales of the Valiant white. So we now have three different just vanilla fifth edition white characters. So the, the Kobo Press one definitely hits hard, but it's got some interesting little dials built into it that I want to talk about. So it's AC 14. Some would say that's low. That's actually the same. I think that's the same AC as the 2014 one. So we'll pull up this white from the Artisanal Monster Database. So we have all three whites here. We have the Kobo Press white. We have the fifth edition 2014 Monster Manual White, and we have the white from Level Up Advanced 5e by way of the Artisanal Monster Database. The Artisanal Monster Database is a Sly Flourish Patreon feature where you can get monsters from a whole bunch of different monster books, including Level Up Advanced 5e, Tome Beast 1, Tome Beast 2, Tome Beast 3, and Creature Codex monsters all available in one database that you can that you can download. You can actually download the database. You can get the monsters in markdown format. You can drop them right into your game notes, and they're all available under the Open Gaming License or the Creative Commons license. So very cool. And we have page numbers for all of them. So you can go look them up in the actual book with links to the actual book because you should get the actual books. The books are fantastic. So we have all these three versions of the white level up advanced 5e 2014 monster manual and tales of the valiant. So one thing you'll see is that the it has significantly more hit points that the original 2014 monster manual white has 45 hit points. So so does the one from level up advanced 5e. But the white from Toma Beasts has uh, 70 hit points, which is not quite double, but getting getting pretty close to double. We can also add what the Forge of Foes monster stats would be for this. The Forge of Foes monster stats come out of the book Forge of Foes, of course. I have another tool called the Forge of Foes monster stat generator, where you can generate stats for any monster from level from, from Forge of Foes that is also available to patrons of Sly Flourish. Again, lots of cool tools that you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. I would definitely recommend becoming a patron of Sly Flourish because you get a really good deal. So we'll take a look at that as well. So you can see that the Forge of Foes benchmark says AC 13, slightly less than armor class, but 65 hit points, closer to what the Monster Vault version has. AC is about the same. AC is relatively low now of course you can always add ac you can say oh no they're wearing plates so now they have an ac of 18 you can always you can always beef them up by describing other other armor they have other stats look all pretty pretty straightforward pretty standard i love i'm, I'm definitely digging the idea of like not bothering with proficiencies for saving throws and stuff like that and just putting it straight into the core stats so you just have this core stat bonuses you don't need their scores you don't need to have saving throws being separated out you just have it wired in there i really like that idea that so this is martial adept manufactured weapons such as horror bows deals an extra weapon of damage that way they can beef up the damage i like that other ones has sunlight sensitivity that's important to note so then we get into the actions and the white makes two long sword or longbow attacks it can replace one attack with life drain the life drain is 10 necrotic damage which is pretty hefty dc 13 or its maximum maximum hit points is reduced by an amount equal to the damage so the life drain is still significant also notice plus five to hit i think that the this one is plus four to hit the life drain of the 2014 is plus four to hit the one from the Menagerie is plus four to hit. So it has a little bit more accuracy when it's hitting. It can also do longsword attacks. The longsword attacks do 12 damage each. So it does 24 damage at CR at CR three, which I think is right on the amount of damage. That's the exact same amount of damage that a Forge of Foes benchmark ma monster does. So this one is actually hitting on pretty closely to the Forge of Foes monster stat block the, 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 the monster statistics by challenge rating stat block line. So that by definition means that I like it. And then it has this long sword attack. Now it also has this bonus action where it can, it can command up to five friendly skeletons or zombies to do one of the following protect, overwhelm, or shamble. Protect means that each time a friendly creature within five feet is attacked, the target can use its reaction to intercept the attack, becoming the target instead. So you can put skeletons on it and have to beat the skeletons. Overwhelm, the target creatures have advantage on attack rolls, so it could give a bunch of skeletons attack advantage. That's a lot. This is actually, Overwhelm could be really dangerous. And then Shambling is they get to move around and attacks against them using an opportunity attack or a disadvantage. I like that. It's not quite that they're moving so fast that you don't get an OA. You still get an OA, you're just disadvantaged in the attack. That's pretty cool. Until the start of the next turn, each target has advantage on attack rolls against a, a creature on its turn if at least one other target is with... Okay, so the Overwhelm, they all have to be kind of grouped together, but it works really well. So one of the reasons... So I so let me just be frank. I think this stat block is outstanding. I really, really like it. I think it hits really hard. It, it definitely works well, and it's got lots of cool crunch. But there's a particular reason why I like the white at CR3. And it's because a CR3 monster 
regardless of whether it's a white or anything else, a veteran is another example of a, of a, of a CR three monster that I use all the time. And that's because it fits this perfect range of challenge rating where it can be useful from second level to like 15th level as a monster against the characters. And let me explain at second level, a CR three white makes a really good boss monster, right? It's going to be hard at second level. It's going to be a really threatening boss. It'll probably wipe out first level. So you'd never want to use it against first level characters, second level characters. It makes a good solo boss monster i would not be throwing a bunch of skeletons on top of it but you could it makes a good elite style monster essentially you have two one white for every two characters by the time the characters are hitting about fourth level right you can fourth or fifth level you can throw two whites at them and it'll be pretty dangerous a white a cr3 creature is roughly equivalent to a sixth or seventh level character which means if you have like seventh level characters you can throw one white per character and that's a really good fight so now we've already gone from second level to seventh level using the same stat block in a different way then as the further along they go when they start to get 10 12 14 they get into that cr 12 13 range these guys can start acting as minions that you can actually throw a whole bunch of whites at them and they can use turn undead to kind of blow them apart or they can send a bunch of away a couple of fireballs will blow them away so they make for really strong minions pretty much all the way up until the end of the game they're not going to be particularly threatening at level 17 and above but up through level 16 you can throw whites these cr3 whites at at players at, at player characters and they will be a decent threat so that means you have one stat block one cr3 stat block that remains useful from second level to like 15th level or 16th level that's where you get in the versatility and that's where we get into the bounded accuracy of 5e and why that matters a lot of people lament challenge rating they 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 talk about challenge rating and say challenge rating and i have complained about challenge rating for a long time cr3 doesn't actually mean anything all cr3 tells you is that it's harder than a CR2 and it's not as hard as a CR4. It really doesn't have any other meaning built into it. You have to do a bunch of calculations in order to determine what kind of threat a CR3 has against characters of different levels. I've done that with the Lazy Encounter Benchmark and lots of other things, but you know, you, you have to do some kind of math. And an, an easy argument is, well, monsters should just have levels instead. If you look at Baldur's Gate 3, monsters have levels and a level three monster would be equivalent to a, re a level three character. Right. That's makes perfect sense. The problem is when you assign levels to monsters, like let's say you made the white and instead of saying it's a CR three, you say it's a level six. The problem is that that means generally DMs are only going to run those against characters that are like level four to level eight. Like they'd be hard for level four. They'd be easier for level eight, but they're not going to bother with level sixes at higher levels because they're like, oh, they're level six and the characters are level 13. They don't match up. So that's why having challenge rating be disassociated from level and basically saying that the way you determine the threat of a monster is completely different than the way you determine the threat of a character means that monsters can be a threat to characters at a much wider range than they normally can. So that's why I think that's one advantage that CR has. That idea that we have these bounds of what the challenge rating of a monster is means that those monsters can be relevant throughout a much longer range of time. In my Empire of the Ghouls game, the characters are 13th level and I'm still regularly throwing CR1 monsters at them because CR1 monsters in hordes can still be an interesting, flavorful thing. If they manage to get a few hits off, they might actually do a little bit of damage and they, they make the players feel awesome by having their characters just mow down piles of monsters at once. So that's why I think CR3 is so important. I really like the CR3 white. One neat thing about the CR3 white for Tales of the Valiant is that you can turn on and off these abilities. There are dials in here that make the difficulty different. And the example is, if you want it to hit harder, you can have it attack as a two-hand weapon attack doing 28 damage, up to 28 damage per attack or per round. So that is a, a lot of damage. You can also decide whether or not you want to use these bonus actions or not. Maybe the, if they don't have any skeletons or zombies around, they're not even going to bother using the bonus action. So that can work well. Or if you want to make these guys really powerful, you could have like, you know, four whites with 20 skeletons and each of the whites are able to command those skeletons and have them all attack with advantage. So there's dials in the difficulty of this one stat block that let you decide how dangerous you want the monster to be. One thing that I would recommend is you don't always just turn the dial all the way to the right and make it as dangerous as possible. Instead, it's okay to run them suboptimally. It's okay for them to not attack with a 
with two hands on their weapon and instead just do 12 instead of 14 damage. You get to decide how tough they are being. You get to decide what circumstances to include them all in and how you want to turn those dials. And I think all of that is kind of built into this one stat block. It's really cool and I like it. So I'm very much, this, this is again making me Really excited to see the Cobalt Press Tales of the Valiant Monster Vault. I think it looks like it's going to be an outstanding monster book. The big question to me, and it's going to break my heart, is is it going to eclipse the uh, Level Up Advanced 5e Monsters Menagerie as my favorite book of, of monsters? I won't know till I have it in hand, till I've seen them side by side. But so far, I really like the design ethos that has gone into Tales of the Valiant Monsters. And in a couple months, we're going to be taking a good look at it. So that's going to be pretty neat. I want to show off a new search engine I have for Sly Flourish. So if you never really spend a lot of time on Sly Flourish, you should. There's a lot of really cool articles. But I recognize that a lot of times people subscribe to the newsletter. I think we are now at the point where, on the average, five times more people are reading the Sly Flourish newsletter than are hitting the articles on the website. But the website, I have stuff that goes back there for like 15 years. And I created a new search engine. So before I was going to DuckDuckGo to do a search engine. But now I have a new search engine that I just put in place using fancy space age JavaScript technology. A in-browser search engine that is called Lunar.js is behind the scenes here and you can type anything you type vorpal and you get all the articles that have vorpal swords in it you can type theater of the mind and you get all of the articles that have theater of the mind look i didn't even spell it right and it still managed to find them monster optimization ghouls and deathlock whites these are all from the fourth edition fourth edition area really really fast pretty straightforward uh, so what I recommend is any of the topics that you hear me talking about anytime you want to learn more about what I've been talking about the eight steps Check out the search engine and you can you can type it in and you can get all of the articles that I've written uh, on any given topic uh, with the search engine. I want to think, so this is one of those things where because patrons of Sly Flourish have been so generous in subscribing, it has allowed me time to go dive into things like this and spend, you know, a few hours. I think it, I have four or five hours it took me to wire in a new search engine for this. I actually am using the same search engine for this that I'm using for the Sly Flourish Patreon Q&A database. And I was like, you know, that database works so well over there. The search engine for that works so well over there. There. What if I wired that directly into Sly Flourish? And so I spent some time with it, and now we have a new search engine for Sly Flourish right on the website. So any topic that you want to learn about tokens, you can you can type in uh, a search, and you can get an article that talks about the tokens. Here's an example article where I was talking about how to make cheap tokens for about thirty bucks that can last you for your whole game, just by typing in search. So try out the search. Go to slyflourish.com. Try out the search. Search for articles. Look for things. And, and give it a shot. So I wanted to I wanted to put a little spotlight on that. So today we're going to talk about the two different games we play at the table. What does that even mean? What am I what am I talking about? This is one of those things that is both really obvious but also really interesting when we look at it in this particular way. When we sit down, when we GM sit down at the table and we're running our fantasy RPG and our players are sitting down at the table and they are playing in our fantasy RPG. We, we like to think we're playing the same game, but we're really not playing the same game. We're really playing two different games that happen to be meshing together. We're playing two different sides, two totally different ways with totally different sets of rules that are in front of us. And we're talking about the points where these two sets of rules connect to one another. That if I do damage, you know to subtract it from hit points. If I ask for a saving throw, you know what ability score to roll it on. If I give you a DC, you know what skill to roll against. We have these sort of interface points that cross the table from what the GM is describing to what the player is describing. But we're really got two separate things. And that example is when we look at the stat block for the white, it doesn't look anything like a character looks like. That monsters, the design of monsters, this has been true since fourth edition. Third edition, you actually had monsters that were built along the lines of the same rules that characters were built with. And that was kind of a mess. It meant that building and customizing monsters was a real chore. But since fourth edition, Monster design and character design have been very different. And that was true all the way back. That was actually only third edition was the version where monster design and character design were designed together. Monsters had always been designed differently than characters when you look at second and first and early editions of D&D. So the idea that you have these two different things, you have monsters on one side, you have characters on the other side, and yet they're built completely differently kind of highlights the point that we're kind of playing two different games at the table. We have two different sets of rules. We have two different ways that we look at it. So, well, who cares? Okay, so let's say that's true, right? And I think it is true. But let's, who cares? Why does that matter? Why it matters is 
that means that either side of the equation can change out parts of their game engine and not affect the other side. And an example is I had, I had people who asked me, Hey, are you going to be running level up advanced 5e? You talk about level, running level up advanced 5e all the time. Are you actually going to run it? Now, what they mean is, am I going to make the players you, because I've been running level up advanced 5e for more than a year now. It's been over a year since I've run a 2014 monster manual monster. And almost always I grab the level up advanced 5e monster menagerie and use that. I've been using that for now a long time and I love it because as in my experience, in my my opinion and my experience, it is better in every way than the 2014 Monster Manual. That that the, the Monsters Menagerie is better in every way. The monsters are designed better. The layout is fine. The the addition of treasure parcels and random encounters and not monster lore has made that book far more valuable to me than the monster the monster manual now we could argue about things like art i think the art in the monster original monster manual in many cases i like it better the layout is also a little bit tight in level up advanced 5e's monsters menagerie but generally speaking it is a really really fantastic book and i like it in every way which meant that i could rip out the Dungeon Master's Guide and rip out the Monster Manual and replace them with Level Up Advanced 5e's Trials and Treasure and the Monster's Menagerie. And now my part of the game is running completely differently. And the players are still playing. Now the monsters they're facing are slightly different and they're seeing new abilities. Again, the, the Level Up Advanced 5e white is different than the 2014 white. In many cases, the monsters are hitting harder. But the reality is it's a, it, that, that they're still playing the same game. They have their player's handbook on their side. They're using the 2014 player's handbook on their side. But I'm running a completely different side of the game. And so when we think about the fact that the GM side of the game and the player side of the game are really two different games with two different engines, and we can swap out, we can rip out and put in new parts of those engines, we really get a, an interesting look at how modular this, this game is. So that idea when people have asked me, like, am I playing level up advanced 5e? My answer is, yeah, I'm playing it now. On the GM side, it's 100% level up advanced 5e. Not 100% because I'm including other monster books too. I use Tome of Beast 1 a lot. Now, again, this isn't like completely wild because an example is, have you ever run a third-party adventure? Right? If you've run an adventure that wasn't published by Wizards, technically, you're flopping out parts of the engine because you're finding a, a, a set of rules, a set of, of, of a scenario that came from another publisher, and you're bringing that in. Now, of course, homebrew, people homebrew all the time. So you're flopping out parts of your game for homebrew parts of your game all the time. And it changes the game, and it changes the adventures, and it changes the story. And you're able to do that because this game is so flexible, you can rip out those parts of the engine. I think it's really, really fascinating when we think about how the design of this game is that lets us rip out these pieces. You can say, oh, I, want, I don't really like how I've been running travel, so I'm going to kind of pull out the very thin travel system that is in there and slide in Uncovered Journeys by Cubicle 7. And now you have this whole new, big, thick book that talks about all the different kinds of journeys and all the kinds of encounters and all the kinds of systems and all the kinds of character roles that can exist for characters while they're going on these journeys from a book that was never even considered when the 2014 books were published. I think that's, I think that's fascinating. So one way I like to think about this is from like the nerd programming perspective of an API that instead of in, in the world of computer programming, there's this thing called application programming interfaces, which is like when I want to reach out to a website and pull down data from that website, I don't need to know the underlying structure of how that website works. I can just make certain calls and they will respond with certain amounts of values coming back. And it allows two different applications that don't understand their underlying technology and are built on totally different technology to be able to talk to one another. That's really how 5th edition works. That 5th edition has this sort of abstracted interface, ability checks, combat abilities, hit points, armor class, lots of other things, where those things all match up and there are certain perspectives. We expect DCs to be within a certain range. We expect damage values to be in a certain range. Hopefully a CR3 is equivalent to another CR3 is equivalent to another CR3, although we know that that's not really true. But you saw me comparing multiple CR3s earlier and you can see like, okay, here's variance in these CR3s, but we can account for that variance. So you have these sort of interfaces that connect together and these different interfaces that connect together mean that we can rip out and change and switch out and custom build and swap out and do all kinds of stuff on both sides and still the game meshes together at the same level. Now, what's interesting is when people have been talking about the 2024 books, there's been a lot of people saying, I don't think it's really going to be compatible or it's really D&D 5.5 or it's really a sixth edition. We shouldn't pretend it's something else. And there's a lot of hemming and hawing, but I don't think it's actually going to be that hard for the 2024 books to plug into everything else that we're using. I think that you could have a 2024 
player's handbook and have characters built from the player's handbook that connect to level up advanced 5e or tales of the valiant or the 2014 books or whatever and they're probably going to mesh well enough in the same way that not every cr3 is equivalent to every cr3 every level 7 character isn't going to be the same as every other level 7 character sometimes they might be more powerful and stuff like that i have a feeling that 2024 characters are going to be basically one level higher in power than we think they are. So a level two 2024 character is going to feel more like a level three 2014 character, but maybe not. Probably again, that fourth and fifth level, probably not. But because they get an extra feat, because things have been streamlined a bit, I have a feeling they're going to be slightly more powerful. They're going to feel more powerful. Same is true with uh, Tales of the Valiant, where I think they've said characters that are built in Tales of the Valiant are going to be meatier and, and tougher than your vanilla 2014 characters could be. But we've seen a lot of variants just in 2014 characters, like whether or not they have power attack or not, whether or not they have certain spells, whether or not they've multi-classed, whether or not they have certain feats. We see a lot of range within the levels of characters anyway. So I actually don't think we're going to see I don't think it's going to be that difficult to see the 2024 D and D books meshing in with all of the other five E stuff we have, because we're seeing all of the other five E books meshing in together. We're seeing tales of the, or, uh, we're seeing Tasha's cauldron of everything and Xanathar's guide. We're seeing other uh, books like Cobalt Press's Tome of heroes and Midgard heroes. We're seeing all of these different books on both sides that are able to mesh together. And we are able to run at the table. Now, obviously there's lots of areas where we can bring in books and ideas and concepts from other games that don't have a direct mechanical effect. So in those, we don't even, need to worry about the api if you like the travel system you find in an osr game and you want to bring that osr travel like system into your 5e game you can just do it if you want to grab the escalation die from 13th age because you think that's cool you can just do it there's lots of times where we can find pieces from other games and flop them into our game and the neat thing is on the gm side we can try stuff out for one little bit we don't have to decide oh hey i'm gonna rip out every monster that I've ever used and replace them with other monsters. Like the, a, a lot of times people are talking about flea mortals. I think MCDM referred to flea mortals as a replacement to the monster manual. You can, but you don't have to. Instead, you could just say, I only want to run the vampire from Mon the MCDM. I'm being selfish. I wrote the vampire for MCDM. But like you could decide you just want to run one monster and see what it's like. I've done this where I haven't run every monster from Flea Mortals, but I've run the hobgoblins because I was like, oh, let me try those hobgoblins. They sound really cool and interesting. Let me drop those in and see what they do. And they did some stuff and I tried them out. I go, ah, so that's, what the, that's how these guys are different than the typical monsters that I face. So you can try things on the GM side very atomically. Hey, I just want to try this one thing for this one battle. I just want to try this one thing for this one check. I just, you know, you can do really, really small changes and have them be one-off changes that only happen at one time. And then if you decide you like them, maybe you wire them in more. But maybe you say, like, I'm going to have a magic item. I think I did this where I was like, I wanted to try the Tales of the Valiant Lux system, but I wasn't sure I wanted it to be forever. So I said, let me put this in here and see how it works and try it just for like a session. And then I was like, oh, this worked really well. Let me do it for another session. Let me do another session. And suddenly now it has replaced inspiration in all of my games because the Lux system from Tales of the Valiant for me as a GM is a superior system because I don't have to think about it. They get, uh, they, they get luck. They get the advantage of having something good happen when they fail a role which i think is really outstanding from a from a beat and a and a from a beat and a pacing standpoint and they manage it themselves which means i don't have to manage it at all so i love the tales of the valiant luck system and that is an example of like where i can take a component out of 5e rip it out replace it with another one and everything works perfectly so this idea that we have this sort of abstract game that we're playing two different games at the table that these games have this sort of general uh this this abstract interface that exists between these different sides and that we can sort of slide things into the interface we can connect things into the interface it makes our game so flexible it means that we can change things so much and it's one of the things i just absolutely adore about fifth edition fifth edition has been so popular over the past 10 years that and there are so many different sources of information that are compatible with fifth edition that we can try out with fifth edition that it makes this whole system one where we can just pick components from all over the place try things out drop them in replace things pull whole sections out replace them with whole other sections and it means that we get to build the exact game we want to build for the table and for the players that we have running at it. So it's a really, really powerful idea. I wanted to highlight that idea and kind of hopefully give that to you so you can kind of think differently about what 5th edition actually is. And that recognize that 5th edition can be a unique RPG system that each of us builds for our table from the wide range of components that are out there. So I hope that that was kind of a useful way of thinking about the game.
Let's do some Patreon questions. Every Friday morning, I sit down and I answer all of the questions that are there on Patreon. Some of those questions make their way here to the talk show. Other ones become the catalyst for articles or other videos on their own. All of the questions are also captured in the Sly Flourish Patreon Q&A database, a database of more than 1,700 questions and answers that I have parsed from Patreon and put into a system so that patrons can search on various topics and find all of the previous questions that I've talked about for the past two and a half years. They're all available there. Today's first question is from Madman Quail. If you were creating a new 2024 VTT only edition for Return of the Lazy DM focused on virtual games and updated for 2024, what sections of the eight steps and the rest of the book would you add, change, cut, or emphasize? Very little. So one of the nice things about the eight steps, and this was by design, this is something that I had considered when I was working on it, was saying to myself, w I, I wanted the eight steps and I wanted the prep process to be independent of the way and the, and the media and the medium that you use to do the prep. So you could do it on pen and paper. You could do it in notepad. You could do it in a fancier tool. You could do it for online games. You could do it for offline games. You could do it for in-person games. You could do it any kind of game that you're running. I wanted those eight steps to work regardless of what system you had. So I don't think, and I haven't changed the eight steps. I myself switched from being 100% in-person to 100% online to now about 50-50, a little bit, you know, I don't know, right around 50-50. I've switched tools multiple times. I went from physical paper to notepad and just markdown in, in text files to Notion and to Obsidian. And I've been able to use the eight steps and the eight steps have served me just as well in those places as others. And they have served many others. Somebody today posted a thing that was showing how they're using Trello, like a Trello board to do the eight steps. You can use these eight steps in any tool or any application that you want, whether it's pen and paper, all the way up through fancy database backed website kind of stuff or other tools. So I wouldn't change the eight steps. I didn't have very much experience with online games when I wrote Return, but I did when I wrote The Lazy DM's Companion. The Companion was written right in the middle of COVID, and I had about a year of running online games exclusively, and I was spending a lot of time and attention talking about and listening to and learning from GMs that were running online games. I have a one-page guide in The Lazy DM's Companion that talks about playing RPGs online, how to choose the right tools, how to set up audio and video, I, and I have some opinionated recommendations here, like don't worry about how they roll. I let them roll physical dice, let them roll a virtual dice. It really doesn't matter. Try not to get on your players too much about trying to roll one particular way. I talk about common technical pitfalls. What are some areas where video and audio chat can kind of break down? What are some etiquette? And actually, Ginny D has a fantastic video that I often reference for good behavior for online play. But I talk about it here as well. I think I wrote this before she had done her video. I'm, I'm sure she would have because I would have referenced it if I had. But how to? what are some ways that you can make sure that when you are talking online that you're not going to over talk how to share visuals on the different ways to share visuals and i tried to make sure that this was also tool ag 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 agnostic as well so i didn't assume you were running a heavy vtt like foundry or roll 20 or a lightweight vtt like the dnd beyond maps tool or albert rodeo but instead talking about hey there's lots of different ways that you can share visuals and then i have my text-based combat tracker this is still something i'm working on and changing but we have a recommendation here for like how you can keep track of combat one neat thing that i've done is i now have a way to kind of do a text-based combat combat tracker that includes initiative in it as well. So you can have initiative, you can have tracking of monster damage, you can have tracking of location if you're running a theater of the mind style or an abstract map style and have it all in one block so that you don't have to really treat have a whole lot of problems going on like that. So I don't think that I would change much. One, so I'm, I'm out, here's my opinion. This is just my opinion and I get yelled at. I get people that yell at me and I know you're going to yell. Some people are going to yell. And if you're good with it, you're good with it right? I don't get to tell you you're not good with it. I know that DMs, GMs spend a ton of time getting their maps ready for virtual tabletop. And I hear people say, I've heard people say that it is a limiting factor in their ability to run games as they don't have time to set up their maps and get, and particularly get all of the lighting effects set up, that getting the dynamic lighting effects takes a long time, drawing lines around everything, getting all the blocks just right, making sure it's all working fine, testing it all out, that that is a lot of work. There are some people who feel like that that is really critical. They've either gotten their players used to it and the players don't want to play any other way, or they just like it and they don't want to play any other way. And that's fine. But when it's getting in the way of you having time to prep your game, when it's getting in the way of the, what I consider to be, 
the other elements of the game that are going to have a bigger impact to the game, or if it's limiting your ability to run games in general, I would take a hard look at whether you need to do that and instead use a simpler way of sharing visuals, use more abstract maps, don't worry about applying to the grid. You know, there's lots of ways that you can streamline grid play. It's very opinionated on my part. And I know there are people that, that want to play it a certain way. I'm not saying you have to get rid of maps completely, but you can certainly let go of the grid a little bit and let go of dynamic lighting a little bit. Share, you can just share copy and paste over Discord. You don't even need to use a VTT in a lot of circumstances. And I think it can save you a ton of time. I know because I've done it both ways. I've, I've built maps where I did all the dynamic lighting and everything for them. And I've done ones where I use a very, very rudimentary old school style of fog of war and that worked just fine and it was much much faster in albert rodeo i did a video where i set up every level of castle ravenloft which is like the most you know challenging dungeon to run in just a, a session or two and i had the whole map up and running and ready to go for my own game in like under 15 minutes for every level that they had so you can do it much faster so think about how to optimize your 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 time setting up maps because i think the more complicated it is the more time it's taking and you really have to ask like am i better off spending my time making sure all the dynamic lighting is working right or am i better off thinking about the characters and what they want to do and that what kind of encounters i can build for them that are going to really show off their capabilities and make them look cool and drive their story further into the game i bet you more time spent focusing on the characters and their interface to the game is going to be more valuable than the time you spend on dy dynamic lighting. That's just my opinion, man. Your opinion may be different. You're not playing wrong. I'm not saying you're playing wrong, but that to me is something that I've seen and I've heard about from many DMs. I've heard it where people get on me and say, dude, in my games, I absolutely have to have dynamic lighting and maps, but also it's taking me like three hours to set up and I don't have enough time. So I don't run as many games. I don't know what to tell you. Like you're missing games, <laughs> right? If you're missing games, it's something to consider. But that's like my opinion. Rango, uh, Rango says, typically in a high fantasy story, the heroes will be successful in the end. The victory may not be complete. Sacrifices will have to be made, but ultimately sorrow under the like will be vanquished. But in a game, the possibility of failure is always there. How do you satisfyingly end a campaign where the PCs failed without having the PCs feel like failures? This is really tough. And I'm going to offer, a, again, you ask me and I have opinions. I am not one to hang on to the idea that failure needs to be such a clear state that I'm not willing to turn those dials heavily in the character's favor at the end of a campaign. I want them to succeed. I want them to be challenged. I want them to feel like they're on the ropes, but I also want them to succeed. And I think that's where having your hands on the dials to really lean in towards that because it's the end. You just don't want to have a flat failure at the end of a big campaign like that would suck it would just suck now another way though is if you do want to build kind of a final battle or something where you definitely want failure to be an option is to to come up with another state if they fail this battle what will happen that could be as cool or cooler than if they succeeded I'll give you an example. I ran a Orcus, uh, a game where the fourth edition game where they were fighting Orcus and I made the battle really hard. And my idea was if they wipe out and they could, I'm going to have the characters wake up. I'm going to end the game with the characters waking up 10 years later, dug out of a charnel pit from a bunch of cultists who worship the characters as these sort of like lost deities. Oh, you're the heroes that used to be. Nobody even believes you exist anymore, but we do. We remember your tales and we've, you know, we've brought it and we're bringing you back because Orcus has now been ruling over the world and ruling over the multiverse for 10 years and it's terrible. And you're the only ones who've ever been able to face him again. And then turn it into a kind of a new campaign where the characters are starting off. I don't, I, I don't know if I keep them at the same level or whatever, but they starting off a new campaign where now they're living in the world where Orcus won. And I actually stole that idea again when I was running my Rise of Tiamat game, where if Tiamat won, I was going to have the same thing happen. That cultists were going to wake up the characters. They would say, it's been a hundred years and Tiamat has been ruling over the Sword Coast, but we dug you out. Or maybe I was going to have Zastam resurrect them and, and, and kind of bring them into the Red Wizards of Thay and say, we have been trying to fight the force of Tiamat and now we want, we've resurrected you to act as our heroes to go and stop Tiamat and kind of turn it back around again. And I thought those endings, those failed endings were almost cooler than the good endings. So if you can come up with a failure ending that's even better than the good ending, that's one way to do it. 
Another way is really just lean in towards them not failing, <laughs> right? And I know like, oh, but it matters. Failure has to matter. Yada, yada, yada. Does it like just, you know, give them a good ending, man. Like, especially if they've been playing like a year and a half, give them a good ending. Give them, a, you know, give them an ending that works. Now, maybe you put in opportunities for like sacrifice. Ah, you're going to lose. However, if one of you is willing to do this one thing and give yourself up for it, that everybody else will survive or everybody else will be able to defeat the bad guy. I had characters who made sacrifices like that in the last minute in a, in, a, in a campaign. And when you're building that last sort of big climactic battle or big climactic circumstance, ask yourself where those opportunities are for sacrifice. Ask yourself what the opportunity is if it goes south and, and they lose. Build those in. Spend that as part of your prep time so that you know that, yes, I'm going to be running them through the ringer. And they might fail. And if they do, this is what happens. What you don't want to have happen is get caught flat-footed on that failure. You don't want to have them fail at the end of a campaign and you didn't know what was going to happen. And now it's like, well, you all died. That sucks, right? You don't want to have that be the end of a campaign. And not after the players and you have invested, you know, sometimes years of your life trying to get it into the right spot. So that's what I would do. I would, I would lean in, you know, you can make it really hard, but with your hands on the dials, you can also make it really hard, but also make it that it's pretty unlikely the characters are totally going to lose. Or you can also say, if they do lose, here's what's going to happen. And it's going to be pretty cool too. Or you could say, yeah, if they're losing, they can do this one thing. They will have to make this sacrifice. But if they make that sacrifice, they'll be able to turn things around. Those are, those are really the big options that you have there. So hopefully that helps. Adam G says, I've been struggling with making engaging and dynamic environments for combat recently, especially with one flying PC and another who's just picked up a flying broomstick. How do you make interesting and dynamic combat environments that don't always involve adding a roof when half the party can fly? Sturges. Next question. No. So... Yeah, a few things. And there's a few different ways that you can deal with it. One is flying is really not as good as people think because lots of monsters can fly. And also lots of monsters have ranged attacks. And also creatures that are flying are really easy to see and target and hit with ranged attacks. So one important point I would make is that monsters have evolved in a world where there's lots of flying creatures. So it makes sense that monsters would have ways to deal with flying creatures. I know that there are monsters who don't. Another big tip, but so so the first big tip is consider that both intelligent and unintelligent creatures have been dealing with flying things for a long time. They're not going to be surprised by things that can fly. So what have they done to prepare for things that can fly? Does the Atiyag have a giant slingshot that it uses to knock stuff out of the sky so that it can eat it? Maybe. So... I don't think it's out of hand to have creatures that are used to having things that can fly. Not maybe every single time, but a lot of the time. Because there's lots of other things in the world that fly. Both humanoids and intelligent creatures and dumb monsters all would have evolved in a world where things can fly. They would not be surprised by things that can fly. Now, mechanically, something you can do, which I do, is even if a creature doesn't have a ranged attack on its stat block, you can go ahead and give it one. You can basically look at the same stats that it has for any kind of melee attack and just reskin it into a ranged attack and let it do ranged attacks. Your trolls can throw things. Your giants can always, I think the giants always can throw things anyway. But like your Atiog could hurl stuff with its big tentacles. So go ahead and keep, modify your monsters on the fly to give them ranged attacks when they don't have them. Because again, it would make sense that they would have them. Either that or they'd have a way to get away from the flying creatures and harry ground creatures without having to worry about flying creatures. So that's, that's number two. And number three, you know, put them you, you say not involving a roof, but go ahead and involve a roof. But you can also have high magic things too. So castles will definitely be protected from aerial attackers because it makes sense that they have aerial attackers, right? Like castles in the Middle Ages, we didn't have to worry about things flying in. Galileo hadn't invented hang gliders yet, right? So they didn't worry about, you know, aerial attacks. But if they had dragons and they had giant bats and they had, you know, chimeras and other things they definitely would have they would definitely have big ass crossbows sitting up on their ramparts to shoot things down they would have wizards who can throw lightning bolts at things they would have magical effects that can hit stuff in the sky so they would not be undefended like this this doesn't just relate to flying either this relates to a lot of spells we talk about speak with dead oh how can anybody ever murder anybody else when speak with dead is around well guess what murderers have learned about speak with dead in the same way we have murderers now who know about how to hide their evidence 
people that would uh, know about Speak With Dead would have murders would know to avoid being seen by the person they're killing or making sure that the bodies that they of the people that they killed can't speak. They would figure that out. And this, the same is true with flying creatures. So think about what the how the world would evolve to deal with the fact that there are flying creatures. Now, also, don't punish them for picking flying. If they decided to fly, let them get advantages from flying, just not necessarily all the time. So hopefully those gives you some ideas about ways that you can continue to threaten characters who fly. Dane T says, I run my weekly game on Tuesday, so last night I ran a game. It was one of those rare sessions where my players all had a good time, but I did not. I rolled poorly the whole night, so none of my monster's cool abilities went off at all. I was using Incorporeal Undead from Flea Mortals. The characters acted scared, but honestly, there was nothing mechanically that should have elicited that fear. The players did not get to see any of their scary abilities. So I walked away feeling like my session was a failure. I was thinking about my encounter balance, D- did not use enough monsters that I, uh, didn't I not use enough monsters and the like, wondering what I did that resulted in me feeling it was a failure of the session. My players seemed to feel the opposite. It had been a long time since I've had a session like this, and generally when these kind of sessions happen, it's when a sign that maybe the campaign is not working anymore. What do you do when you have a session that you feel went awful and you didn't have much fun versus the players having lots of fun? Do you think this means that the campaign needs to end or start a new one? The campaign question is a different issue. Like that one, you really need to sit and think about, like, are you still having fun with the campaign and if you're not, are there ways that you can change the nature of the campaign in order to make it fun for you again? I've talked about this on previous questions. You can you can look them up in the Q&A database. But that idea of like, do you need to change your campaign? That's sort of a separate question than like, hey, my monsters all sucked and I felt bad, but my players had a good time. I had the exact same thing happen and I wasn't using Flea Mortals. I was using Flea Forge of Foes monsters where I was like, ooh, I'm going to have a great big battle. I knew that the characters had some big advantages on their side in the name of two Frost Giants zombies that they could control so i knew they had like really big stuff they were also level 13 i had no idea how much power the characters could put out and they went through i think three times the deadly thresholds worth of ghouls in uh it's, it was a long fight but they just destroyed them and and in one case we had a cleric who was using a uh, sunbeam uh sunbeam not sunbeam i think it's sunbeam I'll say it was Sunbeam. He was using like Sunbeam and it was creating a radiant sun, sun filled area around him. That meant all of the ghouls that were attacking him were at disadvantage and his AC was like 23. They were just never going to hit him. And he was concentrate. Also, he was, he would have an advantage on concentration checks. So even if I managed to hit him, the likelihood of being able to knock the concentration out was basically zero. I had to try to, uh, a creature try to put darkness on it, but then we all talked about it and realized that no darkness wouldn't even work on that. And I was like, wow, they wailed on this battle. It was tons and tons and tons of powerful monsters. It was like six CR5s and five CR8s, you know, ton- and, and piles and piles of CR1s. And they just destroyed them. They had a really good time. And I, what I wish I had done was realize what they were doing and leaned into that in my description. And for me to get excited about how this was their moment to literally shine in this empire of the ghouls and just destroying as many ghouls as they were. And they were bringing that fun on their own. Anyway, I was always like, man, they're having too easy a time with this, but the reality is they were having a great time. And I wish I just had that same great time with them. I do think that the more mechanically crunchy the monsters are, the worse we feel when they don't get their stuff off. And that's a particular problem with Flea Mortals. It's a problem that I had in 4th edition too. That 4th edition monsters had tons of stuff that they could do. And many times they get stun locked and they would never have the opportunity to do it. I don't worry about that with, with Forge of Foes monsters because they don't have anything. I'm improvising most of it anyway. So I, I made the monster up 10 seconds ago. And like the fact that they don't get to do a lot doesn't matter because they didn't do a lot in the first place. So the simpler the monster, the less I care if they don't have any big effect. So that's something to consider. But it does mean when you do have beefy, juicy monsters that have cool abilities, you want to see those abilities go off. Turn the dials and let them get some of those abilities off. Let them roll with advantage. Have them get, you know, give them some opportunities to do it. Give them more attacks until their attack actually manages to hit. Cheat, man. For those cool monsters where you want to see the thing, the players want to see it too. Don't cheat too much, but you can cheat a little bit in order to have like a monster actually be a threat. But you can also learn from this fight. This is what I did is I learned from that fight. And what I realized is that more bigger monsters is just not enough once the characters cross 13th level. I'm going to need different kinds of monsters, different kinds of abilities, different kinds of status effects, different kinds of opportunities and environmental effects that are going to give some advantages to the monsters to be able to deal with the tremendous amount of power, asymmetric power that the characters are able to bring to the table once they 
hit these really high levels. I think there are some breakpoints where this happens. Fifth level is one where all of a sudden the characters are a lot more powerful. Seventh level, eleventh level, thirteenth level, and so on. And like every about two or three levels, the characters hit a point where they have new abilities that they didn't have before. Like when the paladin is able to give everybody nearby a big boon to saving throws, that changes. That's that's an asymmetric change. The saving throws of the characters now got significantly better. It's like shield for saving throws, only it's everybody, right? That's a really big deal. The minute that they're able to to grant, like get really high armor classes and make the creatures attack with disadvantage a lot, it doesn't matter how big they are, they're still missing often. So what do you do about that? How do you change those things up? Those are all really thing, big things that we have to consider when we're challenging high-level characters. And that's why challenging high-level characters is really hard. And that's why a lot of people never even reach the time where they're hitting high-level characters. So, Dane, I hope that helps. And I hope you continue with your campaign, and I hope you really have fun with it. But a lot of times we have these sessions where we feel bad, the players felt good. Focus on the fact that they felt good. And then use the bad part as a learning experience about what you want to do next time. Chris H. says, you recently mentioned what magic items you give your players to certain level milestones. Something like uncommon at 4th, rare at 11th, etc. Do you have a quick rule for magic items by level for both creation and campaigns? I have a player whose PC is forging a magic item. We're following the rules that we agreed to earlier about this ability to enhance the ability plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 based on Helena's Guide to the Hunt. Now that the campaign is nearing its final chapter, we want to make sure he gets to finish his plus 3 weapon at the right time. I would not worry about trying to stay too closely to the uncommon rare and very rare items at those level ranges. I use random generators a lot to do treasure, and sometimes they get items that are more powerful. When I'm starting to customize them, though, I will jump to those rarities where, like, once they're above fifth level, it's not a bad time to start thinking about them getting plus two items. Once they cross 11th level, now it's time to get plus three. And once they cross, like, 15th or 16th, now you can start thinking about giving, like, legendary weapons. But I I would hang on loosely. Most of it is, when you look at a magic item, you have to ask yourself, is this going to break the campaign or make my life harder when I run this campaign. There are certain items like the 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 instrument of the bards like I don't really give those out because they change the game so much. They become such a powerful magical item that they change how the whole game operates. So you almost want to look at the items and say like if I give this out, is this going to have an effect so great that it's going to change how my game goes? Generally speaking, a plus one, plus two, plus three is not. I would worry about giving out, I don't ever give out magic shields that have a plus bonus because I feel like once you stack a shield with a plus bonus on top of armor with a plus bonus, you break the bounded math of armor class and it means they're never going to get hit. And God help you if they get shield on top of that, the spell shield, and now they have like a 29 AC. There are definitely players out there whose goal is to optimize AC as much as humanly possible. I do not want to give them those advantages. So I'm usually pretty rare about offering magic items that have big plus bonuses on armor. I might do it for smaller stuff. Studded leather, yeah, I might give like a plus two bonus on that. Lower armor, I like to give lower armor with higher plus bonuses, but then I always get a player like, can I have plate? Can I turn this into a plate? I'm like, no, you don't get plus two plate, man. Sorry, tough. You know, you don't get a base of 20 AC plus the fact that you have shield on top of that. So you want to ask yourself, like, is this going to really hurt the game? Weapons, like a plus three bonus on a weapon, that's not so bad. When you have things like plus 2d6 damage on every weapon attack, that can be a lot. So I think like the flame tongue, I've given out flame tongue swords. I usually only give them out in a method that the characters who get them are not your fighters who are going to be able to get six attacks around using action surge and being able to get those extra, you know, 12 D six fire damage because they, because they got it. So look at the items you're giving out to ask yourself, is this really going to break the game in a way or become so powerful and so optimal that it's going to totally change how the game operates or really make this character out of way more powerful than every other character that exists in there. That's something to consider. Otherwise I wouldn't worry too much about trying to stay towards the uncommon rare and very rare items at the particular tiers. You don't have to hang on to that system too much and instead absolutely give them the plus three weapons so that they have time to enjoy it. Friends, I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today while we talked about all things in tabletop role-playing games. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did and you want more stuff like this, please consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. It is absolutely free to sign up. All we need is your email address and you get a free adventure generator for signing up and you get a weekly RPG-related article sent to your inbox every week. You can also become a patron of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of cool tools, tips, the Forge of Foes monster builder thing, the artisanal monster database, the Q&A database, 
lots of tools that you get for becoming a patron of Sly Flourish Plus, exclusive adventures, a dedicated Discord server, the monthly Q&A, all different great stuff you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. You can find the sign up for that in the show notes as well. And you can pick up any of my books, including Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy Dames Workbook, or the Lazy Dames Companion, available on the Sly Flourish Bookstore. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and get out there and play a role-playing game.